Hello and welcome to the Cycling Credibility Podcast today with your hosts Jacob Brown and Michael Hack. Today we have a rather special guest in the form of Mr. David Seymour, who is a New Zealand Member of Parliament and leader of the ACT Party. He is a very brilliant man who is a self-professed libertarian, and today we're going to get to the core of his beliefs, what he stands for, and how he goes about his life. So we'd like to get right into it and start off with uh, what motivated you to actually become involved in New Zealand politics, because to many of the New Zealand populace it's rather daunting to see how you'd actually get involved in the process. So could you sort of walk us through how you got involved? Yeah, well, a couple of insights. First of all, public policy is something that we can change. So New Zealand can't move closer to major markets. It can't change its size. It can't rapidly change its population. It can't change its weather. Uh, and it can't you know, suddenly discover a major gold mine or natural resources. We, we sort of have what we have for the most part. But our public policy is something that we can consciously change. So how do you make a contribution to New Zealand and make life better? Uh, One of the ways you can do that is better public policy. The second thing is that anybody can succeed in politics if they just promise to tax one group of people, take all their wealth away and give it to another person. You know, that's basically what every party does, including national. So they will say... Here's a group of people that have some money. We're going to take it off them through the taxation system. We're going to give it to you. Um, It's a pretty cynical version of politics, but that's what most of politics is now. Another version of that is here's a group of people doing something you don't like. We will make a set of rules and stop them from doing that thing so that you can basically wage your tribal warfare on them. So that's what most of politics is like. The second reason I'm interested, apart from public policy, is that it's a really worthwhile challenge to promote freedom. So to go into politics and say, look, I'm not going to tax very much. I'm not going to give you other people's money. I'm not going to make rules and regulations to force other people to behave the way you would prefer. Uh, I'm just going to say, look, if you're not hurting anyone else, uh, you should be able to do what you want to do. And that is more challenging politically because you don't have obvious carrots to hold out to people, but it is ultimately what history shows is best for a country and best for the people in it. Well, that actually kind of leads us into one of the other issues we're planning on discussing later in the podcast, which is acts and your personal position on the marijuana referendum coming up. So I would assume, judging by this freedom-based ideology, that you would support uh, legalisation? Well, I think the, the, the main issue for cannabis is what is most likely to reduce harm to kids because it's kids getting their minds damaged that is the real nuisance that we're trying to manage. And there are two ways you might approach that. Um, one would be to say, well, we're going to have a, a regime of prohibition. We've had that now for... Um, I don't know, 80 years, 100 years, I'm not exactly sure how long it's been. It's been a long time. And the problem with that approach is that it's forced everything underground. So if you are in the marijuana business and somebody steals your marijuana, you can't go to a judge and say, Your Honor, I had my marijuana stolen. If you have a contract for someone to grow and supply you some, you can't go to the police and worse, report get, that problem. If you get sold bad marijuana, there's nothing you can do Absolutely, about Absolutely, no yeah. You know, process. if the mongrel mob sell you cannabis, you can't really go to go and take them up under the Consumer Guarantees Act because they've never heard of the Consumer Guarantees Act. And, of course, if they upsell you on P, that's no good. If they don't check ID to see that you're above age, then you know there's no consequence for that. So there's a whole lot of consequences in terms of public safety, quality of product, civility, standards, and so on. All of those are consequences of the very negative scenario um, of cannabis being, um, I guess, under, um, under prohibition. Now, you know, the, the traditional libertarian perspective, and, and traditionally my perspective, is, look, let's fight it out in the open. You know, let's make cannabis a legal product that's regulated, subject to the Consumer Guarantees Act, uh, where you know the growers are legitimate businesses who don't have to use backroom tactics to enforce their contracts and protect their stash, uh, that would make New Zealand a much safer place. 
I have to say it's interesting right now because all of that is being played out in North America and a number of American states and the whole country of Canada. And I think it's a little bit early to say, but it appears that the evidence of what actually happens is mixed. So I'm, I'm starting from the libertarian position that, you know, generally speaking, um, cannabis prohibition has been a failure, but I'm open to looking at what happens when you actually liberalise it because it's no longer theoretical. It's happening and we should be watching Canada and the US very, very carefully to see if we really achieve our goal of reducing harm uh, to kids in particular by the legalisation of cannabis. So you're working forward from your, uh, your principles of libertarianism and sort of taking a common sense approach to this, saying that we should reasonably approach a scenario, sort of work out the pros and cons, and determine if it's a good policy to adopt. Now, the obvious issue from this is when do you go too far with legalising illegal substances? For instance, like uh, drugs that could be more damaging than marijuana. So where would you personally say this is too far, we can't legalise this even though it might be in my best political interests, you know, you know well, principles? Okay, it's, if you want to have the philosophical argument, it's not obvious why any form of prohibition of drugs has made us safer. If you look at P, what is it about P? Well, P, P would never exist if it wasn't for prohibition. It exists because it's easy to manufacture. When you're on the run, you can rent out a motel room for a weekend, cook it up, or even do it in the boot of your car using relatively innocuous ingredients and not much equipment. Uh, P's got to be the worst and stupidest drug in history, but it is one that is attractive because it's highly addictive and it's very difficult for the police to track down. Uh, I suspect that if all drugs were legalised, one of the consequences is that people would be taking less harmful and less addictive drugs uh, than P because they'd have real choices. At the moment, uh, the choices they have are the drugs that are easiest to produce uh, whilst evading the law, and that, unfortunately for New Zealand, happens to be a very, very dangerous drug. So in, your, in a perfect world, would you support full legalisation of, of all drugs? Look, I, I think people that are serious about that question need to look at what's happened in Portugal. And the evidence is that actually, yes, you can reduce harm uh, by ending a punitive, prohibitive approach. And so we may be at a stage where people who really care about the welfare of their kids and reducing harm in society uh, need to confront the evidence of what actually happens um, and say, yes, Portugal's got it right and we need to move in the direction uh, of full legalisation. I have to say, I don't think the New Zealand public are ready for that, though. So would you say that's why it never kind of gains any traction in Parliament, no one's ever brought up this bill because you think that it would just be ridiculously unpopular regardless oh, of how justified it Of course, be. but it, it goes back to the thing I said earlier, is that just about everybody in politics is saying, here's a group of people saying, doing something you don't like, we're going to make a rule to stop them from doing it. And if you look at the history of drug prohibition, uh, it's largely been about um, one group of people imposing their particular social mores on another. Right. So kind of moving off from that, switch, switching gears a little bit, we wanted to just cover your kind of day-to-day -day life as a member of parliament because I think that's something a lot of New Zealanders would be interested in. What actually yep. happens? Like, just you walk in, you know, you walk into a day of work as an MP, yeah. and well, what do you do? Yeah. Uh, so, well, the easiest way to, to look at that is to take today. So, um, today I started in Auckland because I went to see Jordan Peterson uh, last night. Um, I got on the seven o'clock plane. Traffic is absolutely horrific, so I was um, in the car mostly just reading the morning's press uh, for the first few hours of the day or on the plane. Did a bit of work on the plane on some stuff we're doing in my party leader's role for the relaunch of the party, so just made some notes about things I'm going to try and get my staff to do today. Um, landed here, got stuck in traffic again. Uh, here at the Wellington end, um, eventually got here. Supposed to have an interview with Radio New Zealand for some reason. They've changed the time of that, so I don't know when that's happening now. Uh, sat down with my team, put the final touches on our um, campaign to stop the capital gains tax, and then I um, also 
uh, did a little bit of work on the question of um, what do we do uh, to make sure more people come to our tomorrow schools meeting. We're hosting a meeting on tomorrow schools, uh, or at least the government's review of tomorrow schools uh, in uh, March, on, on the 7th of March actually, which may be before or after this uh, podcast plays. You can delete that bit out if you prefer. And uh, then you guys showed up. Uh, after this, I'm going to have some lunch, and then we've got the house at two, so that'll be question time. Might ask a couple of questions there. Then I've got a rather strange meeting, the multi-party steering group for the youth parliament, which is the last thing I want to do. But in any case, I'm, I'm going to that meeting. They're planning the youth parliament, where um, Valentine Santero, my youth MP, uh, the youth MP for Epsom will be representing the electorate in the youth parliament where all the seats will be filled by MPs mini me's and um, then I've got a couple more meetings I can't remember exactly what um, having dinner with a friend from out of town uh, and then I've got someone coming by for a meeting at 7.30 the house rises at 10 hopefully in those last couple of hours I'll have some time to do some work on the um, I forget what it's called, the end of life choice bill, my private members bill, uh, the com select committee is currently deliberating on the, the details of that, uh, so there's quite a detailed discussion going on on the select committee, it's sitting again on Thursday so I've got to get ready for that. So that's one day, um, it hasn't really involved any constituent work because I'm not an Epsom, it has involved some party leader work, it does involve some parliamentary work in the um, uh, question time and the private members bill and uh, obviously I think I mentioned some, some party leader stuff with our capital gains tax campaign and just a lot of administrative stuff really. So how does that change uh, when you're in government versus when you're in like opposition? Not a huge amount because you know the, the capital gains part or the tomorrow schools review part that's our sort of substantive government policy work. Now if you're in government of course uh, then you are trying to make an advance policy rather than generally oppose or propose or oppose or propose alternatives. But ultimately, it's it's more or less the same work. It's just one and one you you're going forwards, and the other you're just trying not to go backwards. Right. Well, uh, speaking of going backwards, uh, we really wanted to talk to you about because we noticed that some of the ACT Party policy, particularly with regards to teacher pay rests on the previous government surplus mm. uh, however th that surplus may or may not exist in a few years under the current Labour government so we wondered how ACT is planning on reworking if at all the kind of uh, fiscal policies with regard to teachers where the money will come from if the surplus no longer exists uh, well first of all I mean you, you know no one can predict what will happen I mean the biggest driver of any government surplus is the global conditions. Uh, if you have a global downturn, the New Zealand economy turns down and then suddenly you've got more people lining up for the dole, fewer people lining up to pay tax, uh, that affects the government's fiscal position for sure. On the other hand, uh, looking at things that we can control, there's the question of well, how much does the government spend? Uh, if you look around first year free tertiary, absolutely nuts. There's no moral justification for giving more taxpayer money to some of the most privileged people in the society. Uh, there is no economic justification for ensuring that people who receive this government largesse have no skin in the game and no incentive to think carefully about studying decisions. It's just pure political populism. It's one of those examples of how politicians say here's a group of people with money we'll tax it and give it to you if you vote for us so I'm completely opposed to the uh, first year free uh, and that frees up I think about three billion dollars over four years so it's a huge amount of money uh, that could be freed up similarly Shane Jones's provincial growth fund there is no coherent public policy reason for the provincial growth fund other than what every single initiative has in common and that is it's politically uh, expedient for Shane Jones to give that money away. Uh, then you've got superannuation at 65, people are living longer and longer and longer. 
uh, it is completely unfair on younger generations to have to keep paying super at 65 when it won't be there at that age for them. So I mean, there's three easy examples of where you could free up serious cash. Uh, on the other hand, we're talking you know, four or five billion dollars added up there. Uh, on the other hand, paying teachers more, uh, well you could give every teacher an average $20,000 pay rise with, with one billion dollars. So previously you discussed how politics is sort of stuck in a cycle where a government gets in based on policies mm. of spending more mm. and giving more, mm. but that causes a problem of a cycle that can't be escaped. Mm. Now, your policy and sort of attitude towards this mm. is that we should avoid the cycle, mm. but how would you do that given that the majority of the population want to continue the cycle because it benefits them? So with a policy like uh, first year free, mm. how do you break the cycle? How do you convince people to maybe stop supporting the bill, to sort of vote it out? And how would you sort of build a consensus? Well, the thing is that all these bribes and the, the, the tertiary student area is, is one area, but so is the winter energy payment, so is the KiwiSaver subsidy, so is the uh, you know first start um, home uh, stuff. So is the working for families. Actually, just about everybody is part of this supplicant society now where you've got to be in a certain category to receive your particular type of person's government largesse. What I propose is just a reset to that where we say, okay, if we didn't have all this extraneous uh, spending, which is mo for the most part the legacy of a political promise at a certain point in time, we could have a flat tax rate of 17.5%. One rate for all income, simple accounting, simple tax returns. Uh, we, could, we could do that. It would be uh, much, much easier than what we currently propose. And I think that there's always going to be a constituency who are going to say, yeah, well, actually, that is a better, simpler and fairer deal than allowing politicians to constantly try and play one group of voters off against another. Right. So, but how would you kind of go about convincing people to support that kind of that kind of reset? Because I think all of us in this room agree that that sort of thing is what both the New Zealand government uh, and probably a lot of governments around the world need. Yep. But how do you convince people that that's true when they're benefiting so much from the current system? Well, I'm doing that right now by just putting the simple question to people: uh, Do people feel that it serves their interest or the public interest? for politicians to be playing constant games, bribing them with their own money and playing different groups of voters off against each other uh, because you know that ultimately it's a zero-sum game. The government only has so much money, so it's impossible that you are going to benefit in the long term and on average. And if you're someone who's industrious and wants to make a difference in their own life and wants to get ahead of the game and actually do new and rewarding things, then you know that with progressive taxation, you are going to be one of the ones who's been had. So do you think there's any kind of political change like in, in terms of how the government functions, in terms of maybe election cycles or how MPs are elected or anything like that, which could kind of help, uh, help people vote less selfishly? Or do you think it's simply just convincing people to vote uh, correctly, almost? Well... Ultimately, I don't think there's a lot you can do with the rules of the game of politics. I do think that New Zealand could benefit from a four-year term. Uh, we have very incoherent policy in New Zealand and very erratic changes in policy for the simple reason that people have an incentive... Um, or sorry, let me start. We have a very erratic policy in New Zealand for the simple reason that if you get into government and you know exactly what you want to do, then it's still going to take at least half a year to implement it. Then it's going to take another year to get the legislation done. And then another year, and you're basically in the midst of an election campaign already. So a classic example is when we did charter schools. I was John Banks' advisor at the end of 2011 after the 2011 election. Uh, we basically knew what we had to do. Uh, it took us six months to a year to get that sorted with the Ministry of Education, draft the legislation, 
introduce that to the House. It took another year to get it through. Then we had to actually advertise. Once we had the legislation, we had to advertise for people to operate the schools. Once we had the schools operational, uh, then they could open in January of 2014, which was an election year. In the full glare of all that controversy and coverage, these people were trying to open schools for disadvantaged kids. Now, of course, if you had a four-year term, uh, you could have done that in a much more relaxed way. So what would you say would be the constraint of, like, what prevents you from making even longer terms? So like five, six years? Or... Yeah, well, some countries like the UK do have a five-year term. I guess it's a question of trust. Do you uh, want to be able to constrain the power of tyrants, which is ultimately the whole purpose of democracy? So if you have a six-year term, say, and somebody relatively well behaved and manages to get through and win a second time, you've got them for 12 years. During that time, your ability to build up relationships with the judiciary, with the bureaucracy, uh, and become basically a tyrant uh, and abuse your power and your control over funds and so on, uh, is all the greatest. So, you know, three years may be too short. Not many countries have only three. Pretty hard to think of countries that have six years uh, that are successful. So you think four or five is kind of a happy medium if we could... Five's a max. And, and most countries... Yeah, and most countries that have five, that's a maximum, they affect, in effect, they have elections every four years. Right. So are you making any concerted push for extended uh, term limits? No, I'm not, because... Uh, the reason that the term limits haven't extended is that all of the people currently in politics can't say it because people will say, well, that's just self-serving. Of course you want to stay in there longer. Um, so it's kind of difficult to reform because if you're, if you're in the game, uh, then you can't make the argument. So, yeah, it's just another one of those things which perhaps should be done but is simply not politically kind of viable. Yeah, yeah, and that's... That's why, you know, in answer to your initial question, that's why I'm in this game. It's, it's an interesting intellectual challenge to promote rational policy, even when it is difficult for, to make it politically viable. So uh, speaking of rational policy, uh, we wanted to move on to immigration, Act Party immigration policy. Um, so we noticed that your policy is still uh, almost a high migration policy relative to Labour's, Labour's new uh, kind of new take on it, mm. which is interesting, Labour being a left-wing party, you would think that they would be on the flip side of that coin. But uh, so do you, do you think that Labour's uh, anti -im almost anti-immigration stance is another example of political uh, manoeuvring, or do you think that it is intended actually to benefit, to benefit people? Because I think if you're a kiwi fruit grower mm. in, uh, in Gisborne, perhaps you mm. would not be so happy with a lack of immigrants. Mm. Well, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you have different people who have quite different interests but are nonetheless legitimate. So there are people who, in the horticulture, in the care sector, in the construction sector, uh, are just desperate for labour. Uh, no question about that. And they can't survive, in, in, in the case of those industries, without immigrant labour. So... For that reason, you, you can see why there's a group of people, and, and Act agrees with them, to say we should have uh, you know, a, a, an immigration system that allows people who can come and be gainfully employed to do so. On the other hand, uh, if you're somebody who's here, then every new person getting off the plane is a competitor and potentially devalues your wages because there's so many people looking for the job. And you can understand how... It's one of the most natural and primal aspects of humanity is to say, well, you know, more people arriving doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, deeper capital markets and greater opportunity to trade and innovate and so on, which is what the economists would say. Uh, generally, in caveman times, more people arriving meant trouble. And you can understand how at a deep visceral level, uh, people don't really want more people arriving, especially if they're different. So those are the that I think that's the basic sketch of it. Act's view is that we should be open to immigration, but we should also make sure that government services are priced correctly. And what I mean by that is that people who come here 
are paying their way, so they're becoming net contributors um, rather than arriving here and getting enormous benefits uh, with little uh, contribution made by them. So the other thing that we want to talk about with regards to your immigration policy is we noticed that you talk on the website about making sure that they integrate on almost a moral level, so they support mm. our morals of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, that sort of thing. And so we just wondered how you would go about kind of not enforcing that, but discovering that. Is it some sort of citizen, citizenship test you'd be after? or Yeah, so if you want to become a citizen in Canada, you have to pass an exam, basically, about how Canadian you are. Well, you know, do you put maple syrup on pancakes and you know how many how many time periods are there in a hockey game which I think is three if I remember rightly um, those are the sorts of questions that I think the sort of popular view of a citizenship test uh, are about but it should really be questions such as do you believe men and women are equal do you believe people have equal rights regardless of sexuality. Do you believe that religion is a private matter and it is not your business to impose your religious beliefs on others? Do you believe that people should be able to speak freely uh, so long as they are not causing criminal nuisance or defaming people um, or breaking any, any of the normal common law restraints on freedom of speech? Uh, if people don't believe those things, then I don't think they should be coming to a country that does. They should find somewhere that wants to be in the dark ages, I suppose. But more importantly, does a country that is so meek, it won't even state those values to people who want to join the club, deserve to keep them? I think if we're not prepared to say that our Western values are hard fought and hard won and essential to our prosperity and our happiness, uh, then we don't deserve to keep them. So would a citizenship test be, with, with these sort of moral values, would that be the best way to sort of filter out people who would be morally opposed to the average New Zealand citizen? Because at first glance it would seem rather easy to sort of game the system. Yeah, of course it would be, but that's not the question. The question is, are we going to state that our values are important or not? Now, if we're not going to state them, then I think people can quite easily take the inference that we don't think that freedom of speech, for instance, or freedom of religion is that important to New Zealanders, and they shouldn't be worried about challenging those tenets of our society. On the other hand, if you have asked people to sign up to them, then at the very least uh, you're making a clear signal of what we believe and what we value, and I think that we need to do that more than ever at the current time. So you'd almost have a citizenship test as like a giant signpost? Uh, to, to a to a prospective immigrant, look, this is what we believe. This is what you should believe, and now you know. Yeah, and it, and you know, it might work in another way too. Is that if I was immigrating to a country that celebrated those values, I'd be really happy. So it might actually change the types of people that want to move here too. Right, um, and then kind of switching gears again, we wanted to just kind of ask you about Act's policy with regard to the Resource Management Act, and particularly particularly the water which it seems to have been a hot-button issue for your, your party recently. So what, uh, like what does the Act want to do with the Resource Management Act? Um, well, New Zealand has had a, a history of changing its resource management law about every quarter of a century. So if you go back to 1926, prior to that, there was no nationwide statute with regard to town planning. This is the time when Mount Eden, Parnell, uh, Calburn, all the, uh, you know, Fen Dalton, all the areas that people romanticise and pay a lot of money to live in were built long before there was any national planning law. But anyway, in 1926, uh, we decided we should have some planning law and the Town Planning Act was passed uh, in 19... I'm going to forget these dates now, but I think it was about 1956. The Town and Country Planning Act replace that, so we thought we'd bring the country into planning as well as the town. 1977, the Town and Country Planning Act Part 2 was passed. 1991, the Resource Management Act was passed. So you see there's a pattern here that about every 25 years uh, we replace our resource management law. Secondly, each of those times the resource management law was designed for the zeitgeist of the age. So 
1991, that was the year before the Rio Conference, it was, which was the culmination of the 80s movement of sustainability, and the Resource Management Act was very much written in that image. It was all about uh, you know, eco-sustainability and so on. And perhaps that's the right approach for a place like Fiordland, for instance. Uh, it's probably the right approach for a place like the Coromandel. But what it's also done is created absurdities where it costs three quarters of a million dollars for Eden Park to make an application to hold one concert. Uh, it's also meant that section prices over the 25 years since 1993, so roughly through the RMA period, the price of the average section in Auckland has gone up 900%. That means 10 times your money. And people wonder why we can't afford houses. There are clearly really big problems. It's overly bureaucratic. It makes councils uh, consider things that aren't actually in anybody's interest. For example, councils are required under the Resource Management Act to consider the intrinsic values of ecosystems. Now, I don't know what that means. Nobody does. But I can tell you a lot of people spend a lot of money trying to figure it out. We need to remove the Resource Management Act, at the very least from urban areas, and replace it with planning law based on something like the uh, uh, Productivity Commission's Better Urban Planning Report, which basically says we're going to have an infrastructure plan, and once that infrastructure is in place, people can decide how to build around it, uh, subject to some much simpler rules than we have now. That, that's how you get infrastructure built and build houses for our generation, just like previous generations did. Right, so your kind of plan is in a nutshell, simplification and uh, like regionification almost, as in like, so you, so if it's an urban region, you have different rules to if you're Fiordland, would be the kind yeah. of what you'd be seeking. Yeah, and I, I noticed that that was something Axe was talking about years ago. It's now pretty much where everybody wants to go. The Nats are talking about that. The government had a, a, a bit of a hooey last week about Resource Management Act reform, and I think it's based on the really when you think about it fairly obvious observation that an urban environment is quite different from a, a, a rural let alone a, a, you know a, a wilderness environment so is New Zealand lining up for a change in what the Resource Management Act fills like for instance uh, should act in the National Party be elected as the next government do you think there'll be a major push to change this well, no question. Um, you know, last time it didn't happen because the Nats didn't want to. They always say they didn't have the numbers. The truth is that they did have the numbers. After the election, they had 60 MPs. Act had one. 61 was a majority. But they chose not to use it. Then the Northern by-election happened. We lost that majority. And they used a different excuse saying we didn't have the numbers. Hopefully this time National and ACT are going to win but National will not be in a position to play off the Maori Party and United Future and ACT against each other which is what they did over the RMA last time and we will be saying to them look if you want an easy run in government change the Resource Management Act if you want to piss around and you know generally be administrators of Labour's policies as you traditionally have whenever you've won power then you know, we're not going to give you votes on much and your life's going to be very difficult. So that would be a very kind of strong bargaining chip of yours. Give us resource management and we'll give you and we'll make your government life easier. And it shouldn't be difficult because it should be something they want to do anyway. Right. So do you get that often with National where you where you just can't kind of understand why they're going in the direction they are? Because well, it, it seems well, to me that you, you, you find, from well, what, what I'm getting here, you find them quite a frustrating party almost. Well, they're weak. They don't have any beliefs. They are very enamoured of being in power, but if you ask them what they actually believe, they'll they'll give you whatever their uh, you know market research unit has most recently told them. But that changes all the time. To really understand them, you have to go back through history. So they were founded as a merger of the United and Reform parties back in 1936, with the sole aim of keeping Labour out of power, and that's all I've ever achieved. Um, 
the first Labour government gave us cradle to the grave welfare state, the first national government maintained a cradle to the grave welfare state. Uh, the fourth Labour government gave us free markets, neoliberal reform, the, 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 national, the, the fourth national government in the 90s you know, over, oversaw that despite having, you know, just uh, despite the third national government before them uh, having, you know, governed basically almost just about communism under Muldoon, who was a Mussolini-like figure. Then the fifth national government followed he Helen Clark, who gave us Scandinavian socialism, uh, the big government benefits, working for families, which was previously described as communism by stealth, and they kept it all. So, you know, the problem with the National Party is that they don't have any purpose other than keeping Labour out of power, and they're prepared to do that even at the expense of effectively being kind of cuckolded, um, I guess, custodians of the Labour Party's policies. So for you, as someone who's almost trying to piggyback national into a good, good policy, so... Mm that must be quite a kind of frustrating dichotomy because you're always trying to push them towards achieving something but mm. they just don't want to they kind of don't want to go there no well, they want to be in power as much as possible and they know that um, trying to change policies is risky because if they don't work the voters can punish you whereas if you just keep someone else's policies you can't be blamed which <laughs> seems to be their strategy so then but you still find them a more attractive option it seems uh, than labor um, so why is that? Is it that National doesn't stand for anything, but Labour stands for something you strongly disagree with, or...? Oh, well, the Labour Party at present are just completely nuts. Um, you know, at least the National Party don't change anything. Then you look at the changes Labour are making. Uh, we've talked about fees-free tertiary. There's no public policy basis for that. Uh, the ban on oil and gas exploration, or at least the issuing of new permits for it, uh, no analysis, no thought went into that whatsoever. It won't achieve its environmental goals, it erodes our international reputation. I mean, it's just nuts. Kiwi build, I don't know what they're thinking, but I don't think they even know what the Kiwi build policy is or means. So Again, if, insane. So if the ban on the oil and gas exploration, will that be a major focus for the next uh, election, where you're going to try and perhaps shuffle national towards I think that's one thing the Nats probably will do anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, however, you know, w one of the things, if you want to be absolutely sure, is vote for ACT because uh, we're very clear that it's an environmental, economic and reputational disaster for New Zealand to ban exploration of a clean-burning fuel source years before, only a few years before the Maui field is scheduled to run out leaving us dependent on coal and pissing off the entire global energy industry by making us seem uh, flighty and unreliable. Well, yeah, to me, that just seems a very good example of what you are talking about earlier, where uh, a large group of people don't like global warming. Global warming is bad. but And then they see... It looks it looks really good. You, if you look at it for 10 seconds, it looks fantastic. No more, no more oil, no more gas, no more fossil fuels. But then, if, yeah, if you actually start to look closer, you start to realise that we're now burning more uh, worse fuels in coal and we're losing economic uh, gains yeah. we may or may not have had yeah but you, yeah and and this is why promoting freedom in politics is worthwhile but difficult you see the reception that Jacinda Ardern got at the University of Victoria shortly after she did that ban phenomenal it was like you know uh, the Beatles had come back or something. Yes, I was I was in that crowd, uh, shaking, shaking my head. Yeah, well, there you go. And so she took a group of people who had something they didn't like. I don't think it was climate change so much as oil and gas, the extractive industries, and made a rule to stop them doing something the people didn't like, and the people all cheered. Um, easy, simple, good politics, but it's not making New Zealand a better place. So with so you talk about how national uh, have a habit of not undoing uh, bad policies that have come before them. So do you think that you will be successful in trying to repeal, assuming uh, a victory in the next election, whether that happens or not, do you think you can be successful in getting national to undo these kind of 
uh, what you view as kind of really bad policies? Like, will you be able to undo, for example, the university, the free university thing, do you think? There's, there's no reason why not. It'll come down to two things. It'll come down to the leadership of the Nats. Can they break their traditional voodoo of being you know, a conservative party that doesn't change anything, even if they disagree with it? And can uh, ACT get enough support that we're in a real position of moral authority? Uh, so we're going to need a few more votes, uh, and they're going to need a bit more guts. So do you think if I'm voting next election, should I, and I want to support ACT, do you think, obviously... Uh, you want votes, and you want to get over five percent and get another get another MP or two. Um, but in a practical sense, is it not quite possible that my vote will be, and I hate to say it, but wasted if I if I vote for you guys and you get in on Epsom yep. uh, yourself, but Act doesn't get that five percent, and then my vote is almost gone into this ether. Well, this well, ether. well, that, that's it's really interesting you ask that because the, the answer is no. You you wouldn't be wasting your vote you will be electing more ACT MPs because with the coattail rule, if I win an electorate, then we don't need to get 5%. Every party vote counts. So the mathematics of it is that if we get about 30,000 votes, uh, we get a second MP. It's about 1.2, 1.3%. Uh, if we get um, you know, about one, about two percent, two point one percent. Then we get about three MPs. If we get about three percent, we get about four MPs. So the basic maths of it is that give or take fifteen, twenty thousand votes is required to elect a member of parliament. Uh, you can use your vote to elect, you know, one twenty thousandth of a national MP or one twenty thousandth of an ACT MP. And you just have to ask yourself, would Parliament be a better place right now if it had Beth Holbrook instead of Maureen Pugh? Uh, even Simon Bridges agrees with me. Right. Um, so I think we... Unless, did, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about active no, policy? I'd like to ask, you, you keep talking about freedom and liberties, and I think most people could agree this very, these are very positive things. I mean, mm. people aren't going to complain about having too much freedom, really. I so, not. Yeah, given this... Why do you think it's so hard? I mean, you've already touched on it with the sort of the carrot and the stick of the uh, policies where you sort of give out money, but even with this, why do you think so much of the New Zealand population doesn't follow ACT or support ACT and vote for ACT? Why do you think there's sort of a uh, apprehension to this? Well, we know that in good times about 7% of New Zealanders have voted for ACT, so we know it's certainly possible. Why don't they now? I think, well, first of all, you had a, you know, a period where the party was befallen by a number of scandals, mostly of its own making, and that seriously eroded the brand. And I think recently the brand's been a bit unclear, so we've gone off in multiple directions, and our message has been too complex for a voter base to get behind us. We're, we're, we're fixing that. And I think also, um, you know, just a sense of momentum and inevitability. So. If you can't get consistently over 1% and, and show up as electing two MPs on the 6 o'clock news, then it, it's kind of difficult for people. People don't want to join the lonely crowd. They want to be part of a winning team. Uh, so, you know, it's a little bit of self-fulfilling prophecy. But just remember the baseline is, you know, X can get 7%. We know this. And I think we might do it again one day. So uh, you speak about kind of fixing the brand issues and stuff. So would you like to tell us a bit more about the, the new ACT Party that you're working towards? Yeah, so four areas. First of all, we have a clear statement of principle in what we believe, because I don't think we've done that for a while now. Uh, secondly, some clearer, sharper policies. So in the past, you know, we've said, oh, well, our tax policy is 10%, 15%, and 25%, uh, which was fiscally responsible, could balance, still balance the budget, still have enough money to pay teachers more and give GST on... Um, new builds to councils to build infrastructure and do all those good things that will fix the housing market. We could have done all that. Um, problem is nobody understands that that is X policy. So you'll see a much clearer, sharper tax policy. Similarly, charter schools, uh, great policy, very proud of what we did to change many kids' lives for the better. That was great. However, um, you know, it's not a it's not a big, hairy, audacious goal. So you'll see an education policy that's much, much clearer, and and so on. You'll see clearer stuff coming out of acts, no question. Cool. And then the kind of one of the final things we wanted to touch on in this podcast is the end of life bill that you yeah. mentioned earlier. 
Uh, so would you like to just kind of maybe take us through not just why you support it, um, but also maybe kind of a process of how yep. of how you got started and where it is at the moment? Yeah, look, it's real simple. Uh, if you're one of those poor bastards at the end of their life who's suffering and can't be helped by palliative care, should you have to suffer to satisfy other people's morality or their sense of how you should go and when you should go? Or should you be able to decide for yourself exercising your freedom under the protection of the law. And to me, that's just so simple. It should have been done years ago. Um, not compulsory, but it's barbaric to deny the choice. So that's the first part. Uh, I came across it, funnily enough, at a retirement village. I hadn't thought much about the issue. I'd read a bit about Lucretia Seals, and I asked these people at the retirement village you know, what they thought of it. I've never seen so many hands go up so rapidly at, uh, from such old people. So they were, were very much in favour, and I was a little bit surprised by that, but that piqued my interest, so I asked some more people, I found that many people were in favour. Then I started reading a lot of the evidence, because I was worried that it was really just a form of elder abuse. And what I discovered was that every time you look at the hard evidence, the skeptics' claims evaporate. Classic example, one that really got me, I read somewhere that 1.8% of deaths in Belgium are euthanasia without formal consent. And I thought, wow, that's pretty bad. Yeah, that's like one person in 50. That's like, you know, you think back to your class at school, that's probably one person from your class. It's effectively going to be murdered in healthcare. Far out, that's pretty bad. So I went to find the source of this claim. And it turned out to be a British Medical Journal article uh, which pointed out that, yes, it was true, but prior to legalisation, the figure was 3.2%. So I thought, that's kind of interesting, what's going on there? And it turned out that, basically, there were still people who were given a bit too much morphine and off they went, as, the, as 3% always had been. Uh, what had changed is that that figure had gone down because more and more people were accessing assisted dying under the protection of the law. So what you might take from that figure when you first read it is, well, you know, Belgium has legalised euthanasia, 1.8% of people are illegally euthanised, we shouldn't go down that path. What you'd take if you really understood it is, if you went back to the source, is that Belgium's always had a high background rate of informal euthanasia. Legalisation has made it much safer and, uh, and, and more civilised than it used to be. So went through the evidence, found lots of things like that. The, the opponent's claims never stack up. Uh, so I thought, well, if it's not going to be me, who will it be? I asked around the different parties, New Zealand First, the Greens, Labour, National, none of them prepared to do it for various reasons. So I thought, well, I've got a seat in Parliament. I might as well use this thing. Uh, and so I used my right to put a bill in the members' ballot. I then went and um, uh, got offered to be a minister by John Key. I turned that down because I knew if I was a if I was a minister, then I couldn't have a private members' bill. Uh, so it was pretty expensive. But eventually, it got drawn out. It's had a record number of submissions from the public: thirty-seven thousand public submissions, uh, plus a further um, three or thousand odd, or three thousand odd of those uh, spoke to the committee in person, which is another record. And were those uh, <laughs> submissions generally in favour? No, they, they were opposed. But what you've got to remember is that you've got um, the Catholic Church literally putting the fear of God in people, uh, who wrote most of the 20,000 submissions that were one sentence or less. Um, so, you know, they, they had a campaign, but ultimately what it tells you is half a percent of New Zealanders made a submission right. because someone else told them so to. So it's a vocal minority, uh, yeah, yeah. you yeah. would think. Yeah, so, so a lot of high-quality submissions. On March 27, the bill comes back for another vote. We won the first vote, 76-44. That's um, <coughs> all, oh, sorry, it all starts again <coughs> um, probably in June. There'll be a second vote. With a bit of luck, it'll become a law. And so if I uh, hypothetically wanted to support, like as, as a listener, if I wanted to support that bill, what can I do? Uh, can I like uh, email my MP or yep, absolutely. that sort of thing? Yep, Well, it's look, it's down to 120 people now. Uh, you know, it sounds terrible to say, but, but really 
the only thing that matters is what those 120 think. Now, of course, they're going to respond to what the public think, but they've got to hear from you. So it's definitely worth emailing your MP. Ask to go and see them. Don't forget list MPs. They're important too. Don't forget that there's a second overlay of Maori MPs. So, you know, you may not be on the Maori roll, um, but if you are, you should definitely talk to the Maori MP. But, but even if you are um, not on the Maori roll, you know, every area has a Maori MP. Uh, because the two types of electorates overlap, so never forget the Maori MPs. Especially, don't forget the list MPs. Remember that you know 50 of the 120 are list MPs, uh, and they need to hear from you too. So absolutely, go to their offices, demand to see them, write them emails, you know, call them, call their staff, tell them that you think that it is wrong to have to suffer for other people's morality, and it is barbaric to enforce that on people who are suffering at the end of their life. So uh, why do you think that the other parties wouldn't kind of skip behind you on this one, or at least to begin with? Oh, um, look, you'd, you'd really have to ask them, but it's a, a series of political calculations, I suppose. Right, so so you Many think... Many optics, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. So you think it doesn't come from a necessarily legitimate moral position, more it comes from a... <coughs> Like, like with has kept around well, I, I suspect what it is is it's one of these issues where uh, very few people will vote for you because you champion assisted dying. Right. So I mean, you just... only have to look at X polling after four years of, of, of doing it. However, there are people who will never vote for you ever again because they see it as being so morally offensive. And I think that's a real shame. But if I was a large party... I would be thinking, well, what's the, what's the cost-benefit analysis here? Um, gain, yep, probably good optics for the party to be in favour of something most people broadly agree with. Um, but, you know, if 1% of people who are voters of ours go off and, you know, waste their vote on the Conservative Party or whatever, that could cost an election. Right. Um, I think we're just about ready to finish up. Thank you very much for uh, coming on the podcast. Uh, it's very interesting. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Oh, I hope I hope so. Well, I really appreciate what you guys are doing, and isn't it amazing how podcasts are just taking off as a medium? Well, oh, yeah, it is. Let's just hope our podcast takes off. Yeah, me too. Um, be famous. But yeah, no, it's been really good talking to you, and thank you very much for coming on. Cool, guys. Thanks a lot.